they have questions to the end or ask them as, they, as we go. Oh, just okay. skip it. Uh, if you guys want to ask questions along the way, feel free. Like raise your hand, I'll find you. If you want to wait till the end, that's okay as well. Good afternoon. I'm Rick Tamak, the executive director of culinary, uh, executive director of, of industry relations. Had a different title, sorry. Executive director of industry relations. Uh, today we have two great guests. We have Ignacio Matos and Jason Pfeiffer, uh, sort of diverse backgrounds. Uh, Ignacio was a, uh, came to us 20 years ago from Uruguay and has since built a formidable uh, restaurant group, including Estella, Altro Paradiso, um, Corner Bar, Swan Room. Is that you guys do? Mm -hmm. Swan Room. And uh, what's the last one? Help Lodi. Rockfall Center? Lodi. 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 Thank you. Uh, Jason Pfeiffer uh, went to a school called CIA. Anyone hear that? It's like similar to FBI. And uh, has since worked for a couple of restaurants you may have heard of, Per Se, Maialino, and Manhattan. Welcome, Jason and Ignacio. Thank you. So, uh, Ignacio, uh, I, you know, as per your bio, I don't really know much about what brought you here. So, give us a little background on, you know, I don't think you just walked in and opened the restaurant group. So, <laughs> well, I, w I went to culinary school in back in. Well, I don't even remember the year, but I was like, I think I was 17. Back in Uruguay, the program was two years. Um, and in that first year, I get lucky enough to run two internships and get like the right connections. Luckily enough, I got um, involved with one of the mentors of Alain Passar, uh, Michelle Kerber, like an amazing uh, chef. So got very lucky, fell in love with it. Uh, and one thing took to another, and I ended up working with Francis Malman. We did a few uh, months. He's an Argentinian chef, sure. and he has some restaurants in Uruguay. So I worked for him for like eight years. Uh, between those eight years, I also took like like a sabbatical year in which I went and spent it in Europe. And I went, I worked with Martin Berasategui. Oh, it's a three, a three, three star Michelin in the Basque Country. Yeah. I work as well on with the Cesare, which is a place in Piemonte. And then I went to work for Alice Waters in Japanese, a Japanese in Berkeley. Sure. Uh, Suni Cafe as well with Judy Rogers. And then, yeah, an opportunity came to come and work at Ibuco. And after that, I opened a place called Isa. I worked at Ibuco yep. for six years. Okay. And then I opened a place called Isa. It was in Brooklyn. It was like a prefix menu, mm -hmm. a very playful, kind of odd little place near Pariq. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, so after that, opened Estela. That was in 2013. That was mm -hmm. the first restaurant. Uh, and it was a big success from the beginning. We got pretty yeah. lucky with a place, a uh, small, tiny little place with a lot of audit oddities, but a lot of character as well. Um, and one thing to do another and ended up opening Altro within, mm -hmm. I think it was 2015. And one, and we opened another place uh, of Flora Bar. Uh, the Med Broyer on 70, right. 75th yeah. Street. Yeah. The pandemic, right? Yeah, it wasn't necessarily pandemic reasons, but yeah, like the, the, the Met was moving. The, the, Met, the Metropolitan Museum was our partner and they were moving back to right. the original building and yeah, fell through. And then we opened Lodi right after the pandemic in the hotel, which is where Jason has been based mm -hmm. uh, for the most part making sure yeah. that that's off the ground. Great space. Okay, Jason, how about you? What brought you to per se? Did you go straight from school or did you do- No, actually, class? so I studied at the CIA. I did my externship at Gramercy Tavern. Um, 
when that ended, I continued working there. So I'd go to school during the week, I'd come down on the weekends and I'd actually work in, in pastry. Yep. I went switched and went into pastry for a little bit and did that throughout um, the rest of my schooling. And then when I graduated, started full-time back in the savory kitchen again, which was the time that Mike Anthony who's the chef now was kind of taking over and Tom Colicchio left as a partner. Um, so all in all, I probably spent a couple of years there. And then from there, went to work for Jonathan Benoit per se. Um, sure. And I had an incredible experience and worked there for probably just was that about the two years. Per se? No, no, no. no it, 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 it had been established really, yeah. And uh, and then from per se, had the opportunity to open Myelino in the Gramercy Park Hotel. Uh, I spent a little time um, staging at Noma during mm -hmm. that. But uh, all in all, I spent about nine years running that hotel and, and restaurant. And then from there, um, opened up Manhattan and um, ran that restaurant up until I, I came to this group, which was, man, about two years ago, almost two, two years ago. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, it's been so an incredible what, ride. What initially gave you guys the itch to get into cooking? I mean, oftentimes it's usually like someone's grandmother or, you know, something like that. Uh, what, what brought you? What? made you go towards it? Mm -hmm. oh, I mean, so I think, uh, I think there's been a lot of things that kind of led me in this direction, but I would say the biggest thing for me was, um, I hiked the Appalachian trail when I was 17. And when I did that, I studied plants and mushrooms along the way. And I'd always been interested in food. I'd always liked to cook, but that experience really kind of tied me into it. nature and tied yeah. me into ingredients. And like, I had some culinary experiences along that trail in the middle of the woods, you know, eating wild mushrooms with, you know, interesting people. And it was just, it was very eye opening to me. And, and I, when I finished that, I actually went and hiked some other trails and went back and started it again. And I ended up in this little town called hot springs. And there was a man there, uh, Elmer Hall, who ran oh, a small, yeah. no, in hot springs, North Carolina, North Carolina. North Carolina yeah. Right along the Appalachian trail. Um, there's a guy there named Elmer Hall who runs this small little inn. He uses it as a hostel for hikers during the season, or he would do these retreats, you know, around mushroom hunting or yoga or things like that. And it was just his house, just a very, you know, casual, but fun experience. But he just had all these interesting people staying there and we would cook breakfast and dinner for the guests that stayed. And he had formerly been a chef before he did that. And, uh, you know, that part of it, the, the, the cooking aspect of it, he was teaching me and I was really into it. I'd show up early to try to get breakfast, you know, really elaborate or, or dinner or things like that. And he's the person who said to me, you seem to really enjoy this. You should think about this as a career. And up to that point in my life, I hadn't really considered a career. I didn't, you know, I was, I was still pretty young and I, I'd had many jobs, but I, I didn't really have a purpose and a direction. And I think when he said that to me, it really sunk in. Yeah. And he ultimately is a person who helped usher me into culinary school. He's the one who told me about the CIA. He wrote a letter for me to try and help me get into the school um, right. and really like championed me yeah. into this. And then, you know, once I started in culinary school, I mean, it was very clear right away. I was like, I was so into it, the focus, the dedication, it was just, it was, it was so compelling to me. And I, that, that, you know, the stage that I had at Gramercy Tavern in order to get my externship there, I just remember walking into that kitchen and, and just feeling like a sense of home that I, I hadn't felt in my life anywhere else. So, and that never left me, you know, yeah. I think kitchens have always felt that way to me. There's, there's a, almost like a comfort for me in, in a kitchen that I just, I really don't feel it anywhere else. Yeah. And I've been really lucky to have found that so young and held on to that feeling. Cool. You just segued perfectly into my next question, but before I get there, so Ignacio, how about you? Uh, when, when did you get the itch? <laughs> Was it grandma? Well, well, like growing up back home, it's like it, the, the family is all Italian background. So everything is surrounded about what's going to be for lunch, what's going to be for dinner. Like, the, you know, you woke up in the morning and the first conversation is about food. My kind of family. The next conversation is about what's for dinner. Like, you know, and we were up in like, uh, in a dairy farm. So, you know, we were growing. You, you're connected, connected with absolutely everything. But I was not aware it was like, that it was like a possibility of a career back in the days. In Uruguay, it was, it was like, it's it no, you know, even here, there's it's no what it was, what, what it is right now. And so, yeah, I, I was a little bit clueless of what the possibilities they might be and what they were. But I remember, you know, just like watching TV shows and eating with the, you know what I mean? Being intrigued about what they were, what, what, what was out there. Uh, and then, yeah, being a culinary school and like, you know, having professors that they worked, they traveled the world and they would tell all these stories about 
the world and I'll be like fascinated. But like this chef uh, that I mentioned, Michel, Michel Kerber, yeah, I never seen like it was like the statue, the way he was moving. Oh, yes. The focus, but also the passion, the love, the romance ar around cooking, you know? I, 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 and I didn't speak French at all, but somehow we managed to communicate. I mean, it was a very powerful thing that we can still communicate it through food, through food you know? And it was not many people that I met that they speak a completely different language I didn't encounter, but that connection was there. And yeah, and that thing took to another and yeah it's just been in as, as i entered to a restaurant the camaraderie uh the purpose uh the discipline the structure but also the access to absolute delicious yeah. things that you know and constantly new things it was like love at first sight and since then i just you know it, it never ends. It's still yeah. new things to discover and to find. So I think you kind of answered the question that I was going to segue with. But so, you know, there are people that work in our industry. They may work in our industry for 20 years and they still think they're going to be an actor or a pilot or something else. It's like, when did you guys feel it's it, this is my career? This is the move. I, I think I felt that you day felt one. It sounds yeah. like you felt it in school. Yeah, for sure. And and certainly like my responsibilities and the jobs that I've had have changed. Like when I first got into this career, the, the only goal was to be an executive chef. That was it. Right. And then once you get there, you, you think about what are the next steps and what do you do? But I've always felt tied to the kitchen. I've always felt tied to the culinary aspects of what we do. And I think I've always tried to hold on to that in some way, even in whatever my job kind of takes me into. But I think, yeah, like I, I've, I've always felt that, you know, and I think even, in, even during the pandemic, when I think a lot of people in our industry were kind of self-reflecting and considering if yeah. they were going to come back into it or what, and many didn't. Um, even through that, I was just eager to get back to it. Like, I think I always, I hope I always feel that way. Yeah. yeah. So I know as I was uh, going through my, uh, my work life, uh, I, I always felt like wherever I was, I always learned something. What would be some of the highlights that you guys took away from some of the various places that you worked in the past? What'd you learn from per se? Yeah, I think my my biggest lesson from per se, um, patience, I think was probably the biggest one. And, you know, I think that there's a lot of ways in which that ties into your work, right? Like it could be ensuring that you're, you know, patiently waiting for something to cook perfectly. Or, you know, I, I think also the experience of like, you know, working through stations in a kitchen and you might get on this station and think that it's time to move, but you're really you need to take the time to refine that skill. It's like, there's lots of cooks who come to me now and they're like, Hey, I'd like to learn butchering. Can I like work with the butchers for a day a week? And, um, you know, while we try to make things like that happen, it's really the repetition. Yeah. It's the constant doing the same thing over and over and over again for a long period of time that really creates the skill. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you're an athlete, it's no, no different. Right. So, you know, I think that that was a lesson there. You know, I went, I went into that restaurant. I worked through the stations, but of my time there, I probably spent eight months just working the meat roast station. And I'm so grateful that I did. And I just, you know, there were days when I was coming in and I was just like, oh, I've just been doing this for so long. I can do this with my eyes closed. And, you know, I was ready for something new, but, but I just kept showing up and doing it and doing it. And I think when, when I left that experience, I realized how valuable that yeah. was. Ignacio, what are some things you learned along the way? I mean, I can, I'm trying to. Some highlights. Well, the, as I say, with this chef, friend chef, it was like using the senses in a, in a way that yeah. it were beyond the sense, beyond sight, beyond smell, like sound. Um, so that was a, a big one. Uh, with Francis, I would say, not being afraid of the unknown mm -hmm. and like really Venture out. venturing out and figuring it out. But again, uh, Jason mentioned that it's like a foundation that you need to be in place. Like I also work in places like Martin Berazategui, like regimental, you know? I also learn also like in a place like that, how I didn't want things to be. So it, it was a big lesson for me, like rather than complain about it, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do things different than, you know? Like yeah. I'm, I'm no one- You learn what not to do. For your own style. Yeah. And I'm like, no one to, you know, like do it. I didn't love the experience of working there, but 
I didn't walk away with judgment, but you know, years later I went to eat and it's still the best meal that I ever had in my life. And I was like, well, like, you know, how I can do that, but my own way. So th th those have been like big lessons for me. I mean, and as Jason is saying, like, like the repetition and the commitment to, you know, do the things that nobody wants to do. For me, it's always been like my main motivation when not, somebody doesn't want to pick up something like for me that was my motto i want to do that and i just want to do it better and i'm going to do it a little faster and i want to do it like and that's always been the motivation whether or not like it's so it's always somebody looking at that person you know right. so that was i think uh, yeah those are some of the things that i learned along right. the way so what is it like the first time you become an executive chef hmm. Well, thanks. Well, mine was very much like getting a back tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's this experience like you're you're you waiting you're, you you're, you're waiting it, for it. Yeah. you're really excited. It takes all this time, and then you know when you when you finally get it done, it's just kind of there, and you never see it, and you never really like experience it in the way you would, right? So, like my progression into executive chef was that I started at Mylino as a sous chef, and I worked. You know, rel relatively quickly into you know executive sous chef and CDC and you know, chef de partie. But I uh, felt at uh, per se. I was chef de partie at per se. Yeah. I felt very much that I was doing the job yeah. well before I actually got the title. And and part of that was because we also separated so that we could open up another restaurant called Marta. So some of the team sure. left to do that. I stayed behind and helped continue the hotel. And so you know, it was it's obviously it's exciting and you're like so proud in that yeah. moment. But I think there was there was a sense that like I was. I was feeling that way already. I was doing the job. So it wasn't like a huge shock. It wasn't like the next day I suddenly um, I probably had all these new responsibilities. Prepared, right? yeah, yeah, but it was certainly an acknowledgement of the work. And I think when you get to that point in your career, especially for me, because that was, that, was like, that was as far as my mind could go, right? It was like executive chef was where you were supposed to get to. Yeah. And, and that's as far as I could think. Okay. So when I got there, it opened up this idea to me also of like, you know, what else is there and how else do you continue we'll to, to grow and all, the, all those types of things. But yeah, I don't know. So it's, it's an incredible experience for sure. Yeah, must feel great. Ignacio? I mean, yeah, no, same thing is an incredible experience, but also, yeah, like learning how to embrace a role on which, you know, you need to trust, trust others, mentor mm -hmm. others, that like you have a, a lot of responsibilities. Uh, and you have to, you know, hold yourself accountable for an entire group of people, safety, so well-being. Yeah, so I think it's it's like th that transition from like being on the ground and still being on the ground, but you need to raise yourself above and be able to to acknowledge the responsibility that you have. Is is it's a it's a huge. I struggle with it. Uh, somehow, you know, you you figure it out, but it was. You find a way, but it's no, it's, it's not an easy gap, particularly because you, you know, you still a cook a heart, but you have other responsibilities and setting boundaries and and and, and it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it wasn't a, a, an easy transition, but you know, an incredible opportunity. But it's it's a lot of uh, growing pains mm -hmm. that it comes with that sure. responsibility is depending on the structure and the time that you invest beforehand to get to the place that you ended up i think it's i think it's very important that you get the right mentorship the right um yeah people around you so you have the foundation that you need to fill up those shoes that they're big yeah. it's not sure. it's not easy so going back to what jason said earlier you were talking about and thinking about like what else is there so You've transitioned over to operations. Uh, Ignacio's transitioned over to chef owner, right? So give us a little bit about how, what was that experience like and why did you transition over to ops? Well, I think it was kind of a natural progression. Like it, it happened to me also when I was at uh, Manhattan. Um, you know, that business evolved very quickly. When we opened, we had a separate team for the events programming there. We had a separate team for the restaurant programming, which I oversaw uh, very quickly. I became, you know, I started to oversee all of the entire place from a, from a culinary perspective. And then um, with the loss of our GM, I started to oversee some of the front of house operations as well. So it, it, I'm sorry, Manhattan, it was also, yeah, Manhattan. Yeah. So it was also just kind of a, 
you know, like the way I think of it now is you just kind of go where the work is, right? Yeah. Like where there's need, you try to, you try to provide support. And well, again, you felt like you were doing the job before you got the title. Well, right? yeah. I mean, my title changed while I was there too, but I think, um, I don't think of it that so much. Like I, now I just kind of realize, like, you know, like businesses progress, they change, they alter, they, you know, it's very fluid. So like, yeah. you have to be flexible. You have dynamic. to try to, yeah, you have to be dynamic and try and, and try and, um, fill the needs. And sometimes that's you doing something. Sometimes that's making sure you hire the right person or maybe sure. it's training or, but I think, um, yeah, that kind of led me down this direction and ultimately brought me to this hotel. And I think, um, this project was, was interesting. You know, I, I, I had not intended to take another job. I was very happy and I had worked for Union's Cross Hospitality Group for nearly 12 years. So yeah. I was well-established. I was happy and, and things were going Solid well, group. but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when I, Going into the meeting, my first meeting with Ignacio, we had coffee. In my mind, I was like, "Oh, this would be so great just to get to know him." But like, I had no intention of um, of leaving the the job they had. But I I was so I think compelled to that conversation. We both just I think the way that that we both spoke about our industry and where things were at, and I think also the way he spoke about his group and and you know the future and what was happening, it was really compelling. And then after seeing the hotel, it became clear to me that this was like you know an incredible opportunity. And I think. Uh, yeah. I think also just by nature of like the jobs that I've had prior, it put me in a position to be really useful. It and I, yeah, and I think um, that's important to me too, right? Not just from a success standpoint, but just I want to be able to be valuable no matter where I am in my Sure. Yeah. Okay. So now uh, let's talk about another, I guess, sort of transition. I mean, you go from being an executive chef to being a chef owner, partner, um, how did that feel and what added responsibilities did you take on there? I mean, I would think quite a bit. I think it's, it's, I think it's that all similar challenges in terms of like fulfilling, you know, the expectations, the need, also understanding that you cannot make everyone happy. You know what I mean? Like people pleasing is not really, you know, it's not sustainable. You know what I mean? You have to, you, you have to be, confident with yourself that you're doing the right thing, that you have the values that you live by. Uh, and as I was saying before, you, you know, like uh, surrounding yourself by the right people, trusting those people, like those people trusting themselves that they're making the right decisions, not being scared of doing mistakes, owning your mistakes, uh, figuring out how to improve and to get better. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a lot of growth constantly. Yeah. You know, I think that the biggest challenge is when you, you know, you having to move from one place to another, you know, and like being present and engaged at time management is huge, you know, yeah. being disciplined sure. with 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 how you utilize your time and and and, and the impact that you want to have and then you know, in mm -hmm. the moments that you have those times. So, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it, it's, that's kind of like how I see it. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I answer your no, question, but it's like, a, it's, a, it's a very question. profound, it's a yeah. very profound uh, question, but it's, it's. Uh, so did, did someone find you and say, I want to back you? Did you look for people to back you? Did, was it more proactive on your end or was it more reactive? And how did all that work? And so, how do you start a restaurant group? Mm -hmm. Well, it was a combination. It was started with one place, and it was a combination of uh, things like a, a mix of necessity uh, in many different ways. Like or like what I was saying, of figuring out how to communicate, communicate, like create an experience and an environment that at the time I didn't feel that existed in New York. Um, so yeah. And it was an interesting experience to go after and ask people for money. Yeah. Um, very humbling, a very interesting the exercise. Thing in the world, getting someone to write that check. We have a lot of conversation, but it's, writing the checks hard. Yeah, yeah, to get those the money it's challenging. is challenging. It's a lot of people that promise, and it's a lot of people. Yeah, of conversation. But, <laughs> but call me whenever you need the money. <laughs> but. It's, it's tough. So yeah, it, it's when we somehow figured out how to make it smartly, not with a lot of money, uh, you know, 
like all those ideas of the ideal kitchen and the yada 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 it was like oh well maybe we can make it with what we have here you know what i mean the space was no ideal but we make it work you know and it was uh we pay it back within i mean serenity we did a year right which is almost like i would say it's a miracle yeah no it's like I mean, listen average return is three and a half to five years so. if if or well, if at all yes if correct. at all no, that's a In good most return. places it's three and a half to five years totally but uh yeah so we get very lucky and you know at the time have a partner and i'm very fun on italian food i'm you know from because the background but also i'm like deeply in love with the country and the culture and like the simplicity of it and um so i wanted to do that place and so on and yeah it's, it's so been a, going into altro going into altro yeah so and so now you have your second place and a lot more little, money what when did you when did you feel confident it worked and why did you know why did you feel it was going to work when you mean started Let's let's talk about outro now. Ah, so you open your second place. It's always a little different than having one place. The second place is the hardest thing you're gonna do. Yeah. And when I when I see somebody opening the second place, I really feel for them because yeah. it's is the first thing that you have to split. And we're not we don't know how to do that, you know. Like particularly like coming from kitchens, you know what I mean. We're very passionate. We have a lot of heart. You just you're dedicated. You're giving all the attention. And the moment you have to split, it's like something happened there that it's like beyond. Can't be in both places. Can be in both places and like putting trust and putting trust on others and letting go and building a culture and a foundation that can sustain people to have auton autonomy and to you know think for mm -hmm. themselves and you know communicate. The second, the second place is definitely challenging like we were talking beforehand and yeah we thought it was going to cost x <laughs> and it cost double the money and it was way more than what we spent on the first one and yeah. you know you think because you did the first one the second one it's gonna work and it's this okay. and the second one it's you know it, it takes right. you to school so it was very humbling but you know the place is working but once again things takes time you know what I mean? And you just need to have like the commitment above all, the resilience, the, de the dedication, the determination to make things work. Yep. But, you know, most of the time, you know, we, we, we expect an instant result. And as Jason was saying, we need patience and gradually things get better. But, well, this is a process. So on that note, Jason, uh, daily cha challenges. What, what, what kind of curveballs? <laughs> Any curveballs? <laughs> Um, time management, I think is definitely a big one, yeah. probably for many of us. Um, it's hard to balance all the responsibilities, but it's also hard to balance them, you know, in an environment where things are rapidly changing. So yeah. I think that's a, that's a challenge for us. Um, uh, you know, look, I think staffing, finding the right people, you know, the prop, giving the proper training, you know, it's, it's a. It's a challenging industry. You know, we, we very much, for sure. we need, um, you know, the physical presence to, to do what we do. And I think, and that's not just the, the people, but also like the positivity, the attitudes, the cultures that we want to create. Like, so it's, it's a lot to manage on a, on a day-to-day -day basis, but sure. yeah, time management is definitely a big one. Makes sense. Uh, let's talk a little bit about partnerships, pros and cons. I mean, sometimes you have no choice. Sometimes that's what you want. How did that all work out for you? How How is it working for you? I take it all as with a lot of gratitude also. It's like people trusting you yeah. to create and to do something really special that a lot of times I think it's a, once again, like the industry that we are, this very noble. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very appreciative of our partners. Uh, like any relationship is no an easy process. So like communication is vital, setting boundaries, setting clear goals, being aligned with the vision. But 
yeah it's it's no it's like any like i mean i think we all understand relationships it's like any any other relationship it's no different at all i think you know it's a lot of a stake it's uh depend it, it depends whether the, the your partner is involved and it's also hence on so it's like you need to uh define roles mm -hmm. as you know and, and have very clear understanding and also trust on both sides i think that the most important thing is like to have a healthy 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 and positive communication to ensure that you can move towards that goal and that vision and as i say not always you're moving north i, I mean the the vision is to move north, but at times you need to move east, west. As long as you're doing gradual progression, it's, 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 it's important. But um, yeah, those dynamics are very important. As I said, I, I have learned a lot from those partnerships. I've been very lucky and blessed that, you know, I think it's always people want to help and see you grow. So I, I have like, yeah, angel investors that I, you know, that incredible business people uh they love it's great to have they're great yeah. you know and every time that i need them they've been there and they will have no reason right. why of picking up the the phone but they do it because they do care so i that's, i was a good investor to have yeah, absolutely okay so good segue to uh i'll ask each of you what is your management style is a culinary management class so, <laughs> so it's an important one um i'm gonna before that I'm a terrible manager. <laughs> He's actually an excellent manager. And it's Nathan, something that you need to... <laughs> no, 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 because it's, it's something that's very well, important to differentiate. Yeah, I think no. I see things like there's management and there's leadership. It's very different things, right? Like Ignacio's a visionary, right? It's also important, by the way, to see what you don't have and bring on yeah, others first. that do have. Like right. Ignacio is a visionary, right? He's the one who's creating the North Star that we're all trying to go towards, right? So there's, there's that piece of it. Um, you know, leadership to me is like paving paving the way right mm -hmm. like and there's always got to be someone in the front so i think that there's a big distinction like many of us all of us actually anybody can manage something right doesn't mean you manage it well right you manage it really poorly too but there's plenty of people who are who are managers right but yeah. leadership is the piece that for me is is yeah. the separation you're called managers as leaders yeah yeah so the way i see it is like you know you're not you're not there to command you're not there to demand that everyone does what you do. You, you have to show them, you have to teach them and you have to be the example of that, right? Like if you're gonna ask somebody to work a long day, you should be working a long day beside them. Yeah. And if you, you know, like, I, I just think that that is what creates, I think trust and, um, and relationship between an employer and employees or, or employee to pl employee or, you know, manager to manager. It's like, so I think that there's a, for me, that's the piece I'm always thinking about. Like, I don't, you know, there's the, there's obviously there's things that come up and you're like, okay, I need to manage this thing or I need to manage this situation. But what the thought that always goes to my head is like, what, what would the leader do in this situation? How would you lead through this, this problem or this equation? Like that's, that's the, the difference for me. I think yeah. that is that I try to think about. Good. Okay. Let's segue a little bit. Uh, talk to us about trends. Where do you see the restaurant business going at this time? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's it's interesting. I think that um let me ask a different question. Coming out of COVID, there's a lot of things in during COVID. No, yeah. we're not completely out of COVID, I guess, but you know, coming out. Uh, so and during, you know, so we had limited menus, we did, we found other ways of using labor, we found mm -hmm. other, you know, streams of revenue. Out of all those things, what things do we think stuck or will stick and what things you think just go back to, to normal? It's a big question. Mm -hmm. Ignacio, have any thoughts? I think Anything you like that changed during that period? Not really. I happen to like the short yeah. menu myself. Yeah. I like that whole, there's no no entrees, there's no starters. you got 15 things on a list and they progress down. They go from small to big. I, I love those menus. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like we were doing, that's like a Stella menu. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, that kind of, yes. But, 
an edited version. No, I mean, if you if you focus, but I don't know if it's really, I, I, I really believe in romance. I think like you, you have to love this industry and it's no other way to go around it. You, you have to love- You can't it. do it if you don't love it. Yeah, and you have to love, you have to love service. You have to love to serve. I think it's like the most noble thing that we can do as, as humans, whether you're a nurse, Mm-hmm. Where you're a masseuse, where you're a therapist, where you're a doctor, where you're a, you know, a waiter. You gotta be passionate about what you do. You, you have to love it, you know? And Especially I think, this business. yeah, and I think that's a saving grace. And I think it's like, I don't know, we, we've seen that we've been cutting through, you know, like, it, you know, I think it's very interesting to make financial decisions and making sure, like, you know, we, we work as a business. But, you know, like, it's, it's certain roles, like a maitre d'. You know, like I, I think it's like, like taken for granted. But I, I think it's you like have to a really very, love people. You have to love people, but it's a very important role. But like managers need to know and understand what actually this person does. And I just feel like nowadays it's like somehow, like the door teams is like a secondary, uh, yeah, kind of. It, it doesn't come like as a necessity and I think it's like pretty vital in, mm-hmm. in, a, in, in a restaurant environment. Um, I don't know, like in terms of trends, I, I think it's, I try not to look at the trends. I, I think I, I'd rather like figure it out how. What you want to do next? What I, <laughs> what I want to do next? I, I think it's like, pres- like try to keep preserving craftsmanship and like, okay making sure like we get people to fall in love back to doing what we do. You know what I mean? As challenging, challenging it might be, I think we need to find ways of make it appealing for everyone and make it sustainable for everyone. And I think that's a huge uh, challenge ahead of us, but I think it's possibilities. I think it's the saving grace is yeah, it's a it's a very special industry, and I think that you know when people were like, "Oh, they like the industry is going to change," I, I really don't think it will. I think it's I think it it will correct itself, and it will go back to what it's always been. Uh, perhaps, yeah, perhaps maybe people are not sitting down on you know tasting menu for four and a half hours because yeah. you cannot make it financially. You're going to make it to turns. Um, I don't think people want to see the, you know, like the, the attention spam doesn't last. I don't think people have that much time. That's the, I, I think that related with, with time and, and value. I think like we will, th- those are the adjustments that are going to be happening. You know what I mean? We're going to be uh, judging mm-hmm. value and, and time yeah, much more. Value perception is important. Yeah. Uh, you got, I don't know, 25,000 venues in New York City, give or take. How do you get the word out there? How do you market yourself or do you not? I, you know, like Jason was talking about like management. I think it's like you, you have to do it. You have to open those doors and you have to deliver. You know? Yeah. I have, to give, you you a, I have to give you a compliment back. Uh-huh. I think uh, it's one of the things I think I've noticed about you also as a, as a person mm-hmm. as you connect with people very yeah. like just it, it's a it's a it's a skill you know and to see you in the dining room the regulars that come in are some of the best regulars i've seen in new york i've been doing this for a long time you know it's like word really of mouth that yeah I think, there's, I think there's a connection and that that is also really important like you know regulars feel connected to the restaurant they feel connected to the staff maybe they feel connected to the owner and i just mm-hmm. i think that's a really incredible skill as well right People want to be a part of things. But it, yeah, and it's the experience that you provide and the consistency on which you provide on a day-to-day basis those things and goes back to this, you know, value. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that's, I think the word mouth is still the most powerful tool. I know that we are in a time where social media and, you know, but it's, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot of places that fall they fell through very quickly. You know what I mean? I think it's a lot of places you just like get a lot of hype and then it doesn't sustain. It's a longer. Uh, 
what uh what are possible next steps and is new york the place to be good question it's a big question good <laughs> question i mean yeah new york is like amazing but it's, it's some ideas like you know and opportunities but i think they all kind of relate to yeah you know they need to be financial financial financially sustainable but i think above all it's like also like lifestyle i think mm -hmm. like at the end of the day the, the the thing that drew me to this industry was not like money but it was the lifestyle of it i think we can make it's working 70 hours a week that's what <laughs> i i mean i never worked okay. in this industry i i still don't work i do yeah. yeah you know so i never been measuring in that way mm -hmm. like as long as we can get the game going and, and 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 figure it out how to improve the industry and leave it be better than whatever we got. Yeah. Um that's 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 a huge thing. But I think we need to figure it out like, yeah, like the, the lifestyle yeah, element four or is five important. Pounds. Yeah. yeah. And like where also I think New York's an incredible place, but it's also other appealing places on which you know, we could be operating and 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 and, yeah, and, sure. and sharing. Okay, final question from me. Two hundred dollars. No. Um, so you're in front of a bunch of aspiring entrepreneurial students. What are the? You've given a couple of really nice tips over the course of the last hour. What what would you leave them with? What would you like to impart to mm. them? Play the violin. No, I just think I think for me. Um, what I've realized is that if, if, if you really do find this, it's not a career, right? It's a passion. And I think if you're, if you're feeling that, if you have that, that draw, whether it's in the culinary or whether it's in, you know, restaurant management, whatever it is, like this industry is, in, is incredible. And, but what, what I think is just a reality, no matter what any of you end up doing, like if it's a job that if tomorrow you got a check for a million dollars, you'd still show up and do you're in the right position, right? And that's how I've always felt in this. Like that. Yeah, that's how I've always felt in this career. And I, I, I truly love every day, even the hard ones. And I just think that's a, a, a you know, it's in some ways, maybe that's a, a gift that I found something that early, but I think um, for you guys, as you go through your career, make sure that you have that, you're, you're, you're carrying that feeling with you, right? And it's not always perfect at all times, right? And you're gonna have jobs like, you know, my first three months of per se were incredibly difficult. Right. But I understood that, you know, my time there was going to be an incredible education. I knew what I was getting for that work. And I think um, because of that, it kept me going every day and it helped me to get through those hard times. And I, but I always really felt compelled and proud by the work I was doing. And I think um, that's what I would, that's what I would say is the most important. Like, you know, you get up every day and, and you make, you make that job the right choice right? You make it every day. You get up and you go, I'm going to do this again. And, and I'm excited to do it and I'm ready to do it. And I think you have to keep that mentality and you have to put that pressure on yourself, even in those times when it gets really difficult and gets really challenging. But that would be my... Great. Yeah. Ignacio, parting words? Commitment. You know, people always ask like, oh, how... And it's pretty much what Jason is saying, you know, like you just need to commit to wake up every day and just try to do it a little bit better and you know every day and every day is a new opportunity to continue to do it better but yeah and no no uh you know managing your expectations also i think a lot of times we 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 want results faster than uh, results come you know That's good the less the less you want you need to know what you want very important. A lot of times we don't know what we want, right? And, and and having very clear what it is that you want, and then managing the expectations of what it is that it takes to get what you know, and and and, and not being like desperate. Things things for come, they fall through into your lap, or like they are like on crossroads that you never expect. So you just need to be committed you know, in the same way every day, but also acknowledge the opportunities and, you know, and no, as I say, not being afraid of making mistakes, owning your mistakes and improve 
every single time, you know what I mean? But also understand the responsibility that you have, particularly if you are, if people below you and besides you, you know, like their well-being, it's your responsibility. And so, you know, you have to take a lot of things into consideration when you're making risky decisions. Um, but yeah, just commitment. I think commitment is, is, is vital to what we do, you know, and then everything just start falling into play. Good advice. Any questions? Alan? Yeah, hi, it's for Jason. Um, you fell in love with kitchen. I mean, you still are in love with it, and now you're kind of shifting to all steam. Um, find any creativity in that as well. And it's typically set a time management when you walk into a place in the land. What is your thought process? And out well now you're in charge. yeah i mean let's start with that last part i think uh there's a great mike tyson quote uh everybody has a plan to get punched so in the face. face yeah <laughs> and i think sometimes that's what your day is like right you, you you start your day with a plan i always have i'm very list and you know graph oriented so i have a, a list it's detailed i know what i want to get done that day and then sometimes you just can't so i think there's a there's like something I've really learned actually just in the last two years since I've been in this group and, and with this hotel is like, sometimes you have to let go of that control and let things flow. You know what I mean? And, and deal with this thing, drop this thing. And it's, it's, uh, and sometimes you make the right choice. Sometimes you don't, you know, it's like, I think, but your, your intention, right. What you're, what you're always trying to do is what's important, right? Like I make my decisions, you know, obviously there's a financial piece to it. Obviously you want the guest experience to be incredible. But like, what's the culture that you want? How do you want it to feel for the people that work there with you? Um, you know, what do you want that training program to look like? You know, what is their rate of pay? What are the hours that they work? Like those things are, are very important to me, right? Like we, we do nothing alone in this industry, nothing. Like it is incredibly team oriented. And so I think a lot of my decisions are based around that, right? Or is it a people need first? That's, that's priority for me first. But yeah, I think often you just, you're just, uh, you're going into the day with a plan and, and you have to pivot, you have to move, you have to be flexible. So I think uh, it's, it's, it's not always perfect, but, um, and then I think as far as the culinary into like the ops position, like, you know, I'm still very much connected to the culinary. Um, I'd say I spend half my time in Chef White's, half my time in, in uh, you know, in my other attire. Um, and I try to balance that because it's important to me. I, I think the, the culinary creativity, that piece of it, and, and being a part of that, that the culture of the back of house is, is, a, is still like very ingrained in me. But I think you know, it's becoming just as important, I think, to have those you know, well-rounded skills in the front of house and um, to be able to sit you know, in a meeting and detail out the financials. Like, those things are, are, are valuable skills. And as I've you know, grown in my career, I've been able to learn more and grow. And I think, you know, for me, that's also like the selfish part for me. It's about like, you know, how do I continue to challenge myself? How do I continue to educate myself? How do I become the most useful and, you know, valuable that I can? Is that helpful? Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah? Great. Good answer. Yeah. Any other questions? Please. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. We've got a bus outside. We're going to put you guys all in it at the end of this. And um, hire and retain this. Yeah. I mean, look, I think it's challenging. Like Ignacio touched on a point. Um, people really want uh, instant gratification. And I think it's, I think it's getting worse. I think that the, you know, yeah. whether it's the, you know, the, the, the phones and all of it, like, we're like looking for this dopamine all the time, constantly, yeah. everybody's, yeah, everybody's trying to find it. And I think um, it goes against really what, what, what we're saying up here, which is like, take your time, be patient, like put in the work, like understand why you're, why you're doing it. And, and like that, those are the things that actually get you to the finish line, right? Like, as you so, were saying, no, you can do the position before you get to the position. Yeah. Yeah. And oftentimes that's kind of how work is, right? How a career is like, like, you know, 
it's, it's good to, it's always good to be putting pressure on yourself and to try and, you know, and trying to grow. Like it's like working out in a gym, right? You put pressure on the muscle, you're sore, you're tired, but that's what grows, grows. Right. So like, I think it's, it's the same in our, in our careers, right? Like we have to continue to challenge ourselves and push ourselves. And sometimes that's discomfort. Sometimes that's uncomfortable. Sometimes that's showing up and working the meat rotation for eight months straight, you know, but, but that time is, is incredibly valuable. And you'll, you'll start to see that and feel it when you do it. You know what I mean? When you start to really understand, like I can be the best at this thing if I continue at it. So I don't know, did that answer at all your question? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. My pleasure. Any last question? Oh, there we go. What's your guys? Uh, you guys make amazing dishes. Uh, Willie, really huge fan of the Arizona, like hand dye seller. Mm -hmm. And also, I went to per se. I feel like a lot of like for you guys. Can you guys make a food uh, like a menu? Uh, what is most important part about the make a menu? Because I can feel that sometimes I go to restaurant and I ate that. Oh, I only can eat this menu in that restaurant. So what you guys uh to decide to pick that menu and then what's gonna be target and I I'm just curious. <laughs> well I think this has been an interesting opportunity like 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 us working together as we developed Corner Bar. I think it's really interesting. Like where we started with that was really like a bar. And then it kind of we started to talk about steakhouses and how that might influence things and American taverns and how that might influence things. And ultimately we ended up in the bistro. And I think, um, so I think part of it is like being open to the evolution and the creative process and, and taking things where they go. I also think that there's like, at least in this group, there's a really, um, you know, beautiful process of creating something. Like we, we, we make something, we might make it 30, I don't know, some of those things we probably made the eggs, mayonnaise, Jesus, 40 times before we decided it wasn't, it wasn't a dish we were going to do like, yeah. like, you know, not everything wins. So I didn't make it to the menu. So everybody yeah. was also a little bit bummed out. We did so many, so many times. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, to answer your question, you. Yes, it is like sometimes, yeah, if you're going to make it special enough, maybe you need to, you know, let it go. It depends the concept that you're developing. Also. I think it's also important to understand where you are, like understand location. What did, what, what the purpose are you serving? Like we are in a corner bar, we are in a hotel. We have a kitchen with a lot of limitations in terms of the space and the amount of, um, we, we had three different restaurants within one kitchen. We have room service that need to come from that kitchen and so we needed to work a menu that it work horizontal and vertical. So we just needed to make certain compromises along the way, but also understanding I, I'm a big fan of comfort. I love comfort as much as I like finding, you know, um, creativity and places that they may might challenge you and like make you understand or present something differently. But I think it's 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 important to understand what it is that what you're trying to do on each particular space, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Not just like, oh, I just gonna do well, but people that like might be coming there, they have a certain level of expectations, also understanding the market, like as I always say, you know, like why you wanna open an ice cream shop in front of an ice cream shop that is doing a really good job, like. So maybe, yes, you can find a way of creating something that is unique and is your own. Sure. Yeah. How you differentiate yourself. Um, and it can be subtle. It need, to, it, it need to be natural as well. But um, yeah, creativity has a lot of room depending on the concept. And it can be just a simple egg mayonnaise and figure it out how you make that egg mayonnaise rooted on tradition. But that is relevant and interesting nowadays. But sometimes, you know, you have to put it to sleep because maybe it didn't make the cut. Corey, you had a question? I think, I mean, for me, the staff is the, is the thing I look forward to. Like, I, I love to walk in 
see everybody, shake hands. Like I, that, that feeling for me, like is the, is the best, right? Mm-hmm. Watching, watching a cook grow from, you know, garmage to the saute station to meat roast, like those, those interactions and watching people develop, like that's the piece that now feeds me completely. Like I absolutely love that part of it. Um, that's great. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, like things I don't like. Um, I don't know that I really think like that. Right. Like I, I, I think that there's like, oh, there's tons of challenges, right. There's tons of things that stand in your way. There's tons of difficult relationships, you know, there's, or there's always things like that, but um, I try not to think of it like things I don't like. Right. I think of it more like um, I, ideally, I, ideally, I think of it like opportunities, right? How do we fix these things? How do we create solutions? Like my mind kind of goes that way. Mostly I try to stay as positive as I can, like all the time in life in general, it helps. Okay. Anything else? I think that's a wrap folks. Uh, Jason Ignacio. Thank you so much. That was a great session. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you all.